unique about you that would surprise someone if you told them? I was born at 28 weeks. Okay. Yeah, I was super premature, guys. week she interviewed me just interviewed me i'll mine. link it up top in case you want to see both so uh, today i interview my wife or my spouse on this one right so um we're doing it a little bit different, different. than the last video but kind of the same full disclosure i couldn't open the jar i got it stuck so um, <laughs> we're gonna do this you're gonna use the numbers so we're gonna she's gonna pick out a number and then that's gonna determine what questions that i have written here what but i, I haven't written. seen the questions just like he didn't see the questions yeah. so, so you pick one i'll pick the number and then we're she, gonna answer the question that he wrote out pertaining she, to that number we, she's never seen any of these questions so, so oh i got one actually number one Oh, no. There's something unique about you that would surprise someone if you told them. I was born at 28 weeks. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was super premature, guys. Mm -hmm. But I feel like nowadays, even my my pediatrician, Anna's pediatrician is my old pediatrician, guys. So um, she was talking about premature babies when she first started, which was when I was born. She was a new doctor. Um, 1991 she was a new doctor and now to now she was like you know nowadays if somebody was born at 29 28 29 weeks like yeah we would still consider it risky but most babies actually do okay depending on the situation but when you were born like that was a miracle especially because I was relatively healthy for someone that was born at 28 weeks um, I think the only thing I had was like small breathing issues and I had to be in the incubator. I think I stayed in the hospital for about, I think my mom said I came home like right before Mother's Day. So it was probably like about a month and a half or so, almost two months maybe in the hospital. And after I got out the hospital, there were times where they had to like check me and do extra, extra tests and things like that. But relatively for my gestational age and stuff, I think it would still be considered like a pretty miracle that I, was healthy am healthy and all of that um i did have a couple things like i had to have surgery and stuff like that but it's it wasn't what like i think back then the likelihood of someone surviving that was only 28 weeks was pretty low and i didn't have any of that um but yeah i think most people friends and family know that about me but like new people meeting me i don't mm -hmm. go around saying i was born at 20 weeks unless it comes up like you know mm -hmm. um but yeah, it's, uh, I think it surprises most people because they're like 28 weeks. Like most people, I think when they hear premature baby, maybe it's a little bit older than that. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty premature. I All was right. two pounds, nine ounces. Or four. It was, it was All right, number four. All right, question number four. All right. How has us dealing with infertility shaped the way you see the world? Uh... I think it shapes a lot, actually. I actually think that going through infertility affects your parenting when you finally, or if you finally do become a parent. I think that, you know, you kind of, not that you, not that any, not that, not that everyone who doesn't go through infertility takes like their children for granted, but you definitely don't take your children for granted, if that makes sense. Like the little things I think mean more, especially in the beginning. Like I think now we're kind of like getting to the phase where not that we're forgetting that we struggled with infertility, but it's not so, it's not such a fresh wound. We've had our daughter for a year and a half and now we're getting to like, okay, we're parents and we have dealt with infertility versus when we just had Anna, like we were still dealing with that because I mean, I never realized it until it happened, but like after you get, if, when you go through infertility, even if you get pregnant or you adopt or you ultimately become parents, you still have to deal with the feelings of infertility. And mm -hmm. it's still like the pregnancy doesn't like solve all the things you went through. It solves the wanting to become parents because then you become parents, but it doesn't solve like the emotions. You still have to like go through emotions with it which is weird because i didn't expect that right. um 
but yeah, I think it makes me more grateful with her. I think it also makes me a more empathetic person to women who've gone through it. Like, I think, of course, you could be compassionate to any friend. Like, you don't have to go through infertility to be there for your friend that goes through infertility. Link in the description. Yeah, there's a video on that. But um, I think it makes me more compassionate. Obviously, we're starting a foundation for infertility. So that's something I probably wouldn't have done. I always wanted to start a foundation. I just didn't know what it was going to be, what kind of foundation was going to like resonate with me so i think it affects a lot i think it affects your mindset i think it affects the way you see pregnancy i think it affects the way you treat things like motherhood and pregnancy i think you have a deeper outlook because you it's like how people say like anytime you work really really hard for something you kind of once you get it it's different than somebody who didn't work as hard not that they don't appreciate it but it's just different mm -hmm. like the road you went to to get it was harder and so the way you see it is different like it's it's true in infertility as well right. like and do you feel like well i, I think you already touched it. i was gonna ask do well, you have any, yeah well you, do you have any advice for other parents but you kind of already said it like you know being more compassionate and follow the video about who, people who go through infertility yeah, or people who right now who, who are dealt with who are, who still are dealing, dealing with, with it, it right now but. well that's a little different I mean, to be honest, I always say, like, th that question is so hard for me to answer because anytime I've had multiple women now that, like, even when I was going through infertility, like, being there for each other and and even, like, getting pregnant after infertility, I've had people ask me the question, like, what's the advice to me or what's the advice to my friend going through it? And the thing is that, at least for me, like, there is nothing you could really say to you could do to... It's like one of those problems, you, you can't fix it. So my best advice to someone who has someone in their life going through infertility and they want to be there is just to listen when they want to talk and when they don't want to talk about it, respect that. Because that's all you really can do. Unless you have, I mean, there's no like, unless you can magically, like unless you have like divine intervention connections that no one knows about, like there's nothing you could do because what that person needs to start, even start the healing i'm not saying it heals it heals all the wounds you just have to work on yourself and your feelings but like what that person needs is to become a parent in whatever way like that doesn't always mean pregnancy there are people who go through infertility who you know end up getting a surrogate or end up adopting and you still are going to be grateful to become a parent in any way but what that person needs to even start the healing is to become a parent and that that can't that that desire that's not being fulfilled when you're going through infertility cannot be fulfilled by anything else. Mm -hmm. There's no replacement for, I want to be a mother and I am un and I'm unable to, or I want to be a father and I'm unable to. There's like no replacement because it's so personal and it's so important. And it's just, you know, like I'll, I'll always say emotionally, I think that's the most painful thing that we've gone through in our marriage. And I think it's the most painful thing we probably will ever go through in our marriage. Mm -hmm. So there's no solution. So the best thing is to listen, if you're a friend, to listen if they want to talk. And if they're in a space where they really just don't want to talk about their journey, respect that they're in that place and be there for it when they want to talk. Mm -hmm. Next. Oh, next number. Mm -hmm. Six. Uh, why did you marry me? Why did I marry you? Yeah. What do you mean, why? Well, what was the thing that made you want to marry me? I mean, we fell in love. You mean like, I don't know what that means. Like, what made you want to marry me? The things about you? Uh, sure. I mean, what do you mean? <laughs> mm. Um. Well, I mean, I think I've touched on it on some of the videos, but probably not in a deep way. But like before Sam... I would always say I'm not going to get married unless I find the person that basically proves me wrong. And I think that's because like I'm a child of divorce and my parents got divorced later in my life, like in my teen years. And so your teen years are obviously very momental to how you're going to, I think it's, you know, your teen years, late teen years, like that's where 
I think it's different if your if your parents get divorced when you're early. Obviously, it affects you, but I think it affects you a little bit different when it comes to like dating, relationships, and trust and all that. When you are a child divorced, who sees the divorce when you are already old enough to understand certain things, and so for me, that created commitment issues and trust issues in dating and relationships. And basically, I would always say, even though I deep down like wanted to get married. I didn't trust people enough to even date, so I didn't really see it. Like, I didn't see myself being able to do that. So I would always say I'm not going to get married unless I find the person to, like, prove me wrong. Like, prove, like, for to, to have somebody that I really trusted. And basically, like, I needed somebody that made me feel safe in their... Not safe, like, protected, like, from a fight or anything safe in the sense of like um say um what do you mean say like uh emotionally like spiritually safe i guess like emotionally safe like somebody that i didn't have to question the authenticity or the seriousness of the relationship like sometimes you think you're in a serious relationship and really the person's like on the side like cheating or not taking it as serious like i guess i needed to feel like the person was in it the way i was in it and i just needed to feel like if somebody could handle my walls and 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 be patient enough to let me bring the walls down that i needed to bring down and that we needed to have like trust and i thought it was gonna be fine hard to find that person um and then and then we when we started dating like i was able to actually trust you and i don't know if it was because we were friends first like that could have been part of it because we were friends and we had a foundation other than just starting to date but even when we started dating it changed the relationship completely so i wasn't sure if just because i could trust you as a friend that i was going to be able to trust you as more but we were at i had found that it slowly progressed and obviously as our relationship became more serious um I do believe in marriage like I believe and and then like we grew up we grew up in our relationship when we mm -hmm. first met we were 21 and 22 mm -hmm. and when we actually you know got engaged we were like in our mid 20s and when we actually got married we were like in our later 20s so like we grew up in a sense like we weren't kids when we met we weren't like teenagers or high school sweethearts but we still grew up like I think there's a even though it's sounds small it sounds like a small age gap you grow up a lot in your 20s there's a big difference between 20 and 22 there's a big difference between 22 and 25 there's a big difference between 25 and 29 no i'm just saying so like even though it sounds like oh you just you, you dated in your 20s and you were adults we were adults but we really grew and it's like you um i forgot what i was gonna say but like us growing to that level like you know then i started to think about life a little bit different i always wanted kids i just didn't know where these pieces were gonna fit it's like i always wanted to believe in marriage and i always wanted to get married but i didn't know how i was gonna trust someone for that to actually happen and then when i finally figured that out in our relationship it's like i always wanted kids but i didn't know how that was gonna fit because i didn't want kids to not if i wasn't married mm -hmm. i don't know it's it just all worked it just all worked and I don't know when we were dating it felt different when we were dating it didn't feel i didn't feel like i had to have my walls up i didn't feel afraid all the other times like dating or even thinking about dating i was afraid i was always afraid i had commitment issues i had trust issues i had just fear of like getting hurt fear of like the taking the chance and with us none of that existed it didn't even exist special now. What do you mean you feel special? You're my husband. Mm. Next question. You're crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Three. Three. All right. What is one hard and or difficult lesson life has taught you? Uh, Maybe you could pick anyone. I don't know. A hard or difficult lesson life has taught me. I feel like I feel like I haven't had a hard life, but I've had a lot of hard times in my life. Okay. If that makes sense. So let's just pick one. So that's just the thing. Lesson. If I 
if I'm going by the most recent stuff and things like that, then it would be the infertility and what that taught me. But if I'm going by other things I learned, that's what I'm saying. Like, I haven't had a hard life in the sense of like, oh, like some people have a hard life where genuinely like it's always been hard and that's all it's mm -hmm. been. But like for me, I haven't had a hard life, but I've had hard times in my life. Like um, things I went through in college. Um, like you guys know, like I had the story time of getting hit by the car. That was like a hard time, obviously infertility. So I think life has taught me that like you have to, that anything that's worth it is going to be fought for even, like you know mm -hmm. so like even getting through all those things that i mentioned i had to fight to get through them like getting hit by the car the anxiety that that came with i had to like fight through that in my own like everything like anything that you go through yeah there's a part of it that's going to be worth it but it's a fight to get to it so you have to like fight through it you like and you have to have that fight in you there's people that don't have that fight in them and that's what causes people to like give up right yeah exactly because you wanna but life is not going to like life is not gonna give up if that makes sense life is not gonna like become easier because you're ready to give up like yeah, it, no. it's actually gonna be harder if you be ready to give up yeah, if that makes true. sense so like true. absolutely it's like never gonna you know yeah okay next I think there's probably more, but that's what I could think of right now. Two. What is a a favorite childhood memory? Oh, we've talked about this before. A favorite childhood memory. Well, I won't say the one I said in the last video where that kind of came up. But um, besides that, favorite childhood memory is like my grandma's Halloween parties, guys. Mm. So my grandmother used to have, she used to run like, uh babysitting like a daycare in, like and so she used to watch me and all my cousins plus other kids in this so me like when i was younger and then even when i went to school after school same thing with my cousins but she also had her kids that she would babysit from other people that was her job and um so every halloween uh she would throw these really elaborate kid parties for all the kids she babysat all the kids in the building and her and her grandchildren us and she would bake like all these Halloween cookies and just like really get into the theme of it and bake all these like cook all these Halloween themed food for the kids and it was just super creative and fun and she still sends cookies you mm -hmm. guys know she still sends cookies and stuff like that but like we used to have like the whole building of all the kids coming and just like it made the Halloween special because it was like, yeah, I did go trick-or-treating like everybody else and yeah, I did enjoy that but I, we had something in our family that was different than everybody yeah. else as well right. it really sounds like grandma's house was very lively you know i really wish it was lively it still is but she's in florida now so mm -hmm. and there's no little kids running around besides anna so mm -hmm. you know Go for it. next oh. seven. Oh, bottom let's see how do you feel your parents prepped you for child for adulthood uh I think it's true what my dad said the other day to us like to an extent that you know they trusted that I had a good head on my shoulders and they allowed me to make certain decisions um my dad was kind of overprotective about certain things um but he did allow me to make certain decisions even though I think it scared him at times my mom was less overprotective but still they both still allowed me to like make decisions and they still trusted me so there was like some kind of like some sort of structure in some way no. there was structure because my dad was strict mm -hmm. but i'm saying like they you know they always joke and it's a joke i mean they say it's not a joke but it's a joke that i like raised myself and what they mean is like that like my mom says like when I became ready to get potty trained I went I got potty trained super quick like I just kind of was always independent mm -hmm. um and for the most part they allowed me to be I had rules and structure but they allowed me to be the independent person mm -hmm. that I was gotcha. besides the protection part yeah. but that's a parent's job too but like they allowed that and um 
I also think that once I, they baby me when I was a baby. Mm -hmm. And they treated me like a kid when I was a kid. Yeah. But once I started to grow up, they didn't baby me. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that prepared me for adulthood. Because some people baby their teenagers. Mm -hmm. Like, they're still babying their teenagers. They're still, like, you know, um, coddling their mm -hmm. teenage kid or their adult kid sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they didn't do that. Like, once I was an adult, or, you know, a young adult... I still had certain rules because I was living in their house or my mom's house because they were divorced by then. But um, I still had certain rules, but they treated me like age appropriate. Mm. Like, it's like, you're 18 now. We expect that you respect our rules, but we also know that you're an adult and we're going to like put thing, you know, like once I had a job, for example, I didn't ask them for money and they didn't expect me to ask them for mm. money because you have a job. Yeah. It was different if I didn't have a job, but I pretty much always had a job um other than that i think also like they spoke to me about life okay like they didn't coddle me in that sense like you know my mom had the sex talk with me you know like multiple times but like i i wouldn't say starting young because i actually probably would start talking to anna nowadays younger but you know she always reiterated it was always like open and they talked to me about adult stuff. They talked to me about the reality of like young relationships. They talked to me about, like I said, sex, puberty, like, you know, um, you know, like just the, the, the peer pressure, like all the things that maybe some parents, I feel like some parents shy away from like, I don't know how to talk to my kids about, mm -hmm. you know, this or that or you know i want to talk to my kids because i want to prevent certain things but i don't know how to open those conversations those were like daily weekly monthly conversations in my house that's really cool because then like you said you and that's how i that's thought. how we you know aspire to raise anna probably even more because i feel like there's even more dangers in that sense nowadays mm. so i feel like you have to talk about even more like for example my parents never really talked to me about cyberbullying because i don't think that was Necessary necessarily thing. a big thing back mm -hmm. then and i think that's a big conversation that we're gonna have to have um i think like my mom starting to talk to me about sex when i was like nine that was appropriate but nowadays i feel like it needs to start at like obviously age appropriate like age appropriate conversation but i feel like it needs to start like really early yeah. <laughs> really early <laughs> over next 10. Ooh, bottom. What does the world need now from you? Or like basically, what is your special talent that you think you need to share with the world? Like your purpose? Um, well, besides my writing, I think a lot of things can come out in your writing. I think as writers, we write because we have something to say and something to share for the world. Whether it's fiction or not, you could put things in your writing that are going to help people, teach people, guide people, all kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But besides that, um, I think that I honestly, at this point, I never thought this before while going through it because I couldn't see past the darkness, I guess. But I think that looking back now and, and seeing the full journey, I think we went through infertility, yes, to grow and to learn certain things that we needed to learn, but also to be compassionate to help others mm -hmm. that are going through that. So I think that the world needs what we're building in the in the community and in the foundation that we're trying to build and in all that we're gonna do in the future when we actually have that foundation and all those people that we're gonna help and you know, all of that. So right. a lot of stuff actually, but Go for it. next. Nine. Oh man, nine. How do you feel about well, how do you feel about the world we live in today, which you kind of already answered already before? Oh my God, you know this already. I told you the world we live in today stresses me out. Mm. As a parent, it stresses me out because I don't like the way our children are necessarily going to grow up. Mm. Like in this house, they're going to grow up how we raise them and with the values we raise them. 
but obviously your children have influence from the outside world as well because they live in the outside world as mm -hmm. well as your house and there's a lot that i don't agree with mm -hmm. and there's a lot that is in my opinion kind of backwards mm -hmm. and um we'd have to maneuver like you always want your kids to come back to their roots of their house and their family and all of that. But like I said, they all obviously get influences from, yes, you, but, you know, the outside world too. They're part of that. Mm -hmm. So I hope that, you know, she can maneuver them. I think that I was a very strong-minded person even as a kid. And I think Anna takes after me in that, but she's only one years old, so we don't know. But mm -hmm. I think she does, and I hope she does because she's gonna need it. Yeah. Here, here. Mm -hmm. All right. I like that, I like that. All right. Next five. Thing. Five. Oh, okay. So you kind of already alluded to this a little bit before, but uh, our parents grew up a certain way, as did we. What are some things that you would do differently? differently well i said kind of what i would do the same that i would keep that open communication that i would raise her to be independent that i would all of that differently i i'm not going to say that i wouldn't be as strict because i think we are strict mm -hmm. but there are certain things that i wasn't allowed to do that i would allow mm -hmm. her to do um and i say that now it could change obviously but um and also i think i would raise her like i think i would differently i think certain things have to be done differently because it's just the times like even like how do you handle social media and your kid obviously we're on social media with her but also her own social media like she's gonna have rules to that like we see YouTube, like what we're building on YouTube, we kind of see it as a job and we see her as, you know, part of that empire that we're building. And if she ever chose not to be on our channel, then we would pivot that and she would be allowed to not be on our channel because mm -hmm. it's her right right now. She's a baby and, you know, she isn't in all our videos, obviously, like today, like, but we do feature her and that's because she seems to enjoy the camera and she enjoys the camera on and off YouTube. So yeah. whatever. But if she ever grew up and said, hey, I don't want to do videos anymore. I don't want to be on YouTube. I don't want to be or I don't want to be on the family channel. That's her right to say that. And we would pivot it. But what if she said she wanted social media like really young? I think it's OK to have social media when you're old enough to decipher it. But I don't you know, it's different when we choose to share her on the channel because we have boundaries. We've talked about what the boundaries are of what we do and don't share about Anna. We have a lot of rules when it comes to what we do and don't share with her, like about her on our YouTube. We don't just share everything. We don't overly post her. We don't, like, I don't feel like we do. And we're always having that conversation. And like, we said it to each other, like it can always change. We could choose to stop sharing her one day. Like those are our decisions as parents because she's too young to make the decisions for herself right now mm. but when she is old enough if she was to choose to not be on the channel that's her choice but with if she wanted social media really young even social media just to like connect with her friends we'd have to talk about that and have rules about it like and i think that she shouldn't be on it super young like i don't really like when you know a five-year-old has their own instagram it's different if like their parents post a picture, they're choosing, that's their kid, that's their right. And as long as it's appropriate and not like invading the kid's privacy, I think it's okay. But it's different if you're like the five-year-old having their own stuff. I don't really like that because I don't like the kid having access on their own. Mm -hmm. Like even if it's monitored, I feel like things could happen. Right. So That's fair to say. The last one. But not just social media. Like, I don't know. I think the world is different. So you have to do certain things differently. Mm -hmm. Um in general yeah that's the last one eight number eight wow what a way to end this one ready mm -hmm. after getting hit by the car what, i'll link the video what do you feel life was trying to teach you or show you um after getting hit by the car i wasn't afraid to take chances anymore all right um, in dating and other things, um, 
getting hit by the car changed my complete perspective all the fears that i told you guys i had like oh i would i was fearful today i was fearful. like i don't even think we would have got together mm. because i think i still would have been afraid but even chances in like i started writing again chances in college like this the way i lived my life i was afraid before and very cautious and i'm not like that anymore i'm not a cautious i'm a cautious person when it comes to like you know, I don't, you know, I wouldn't go skydiving kind of cautious or like I'm cautious with like money, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm not cautious with taking risks that I feel like need to be taken in order for me to get where I want to be in life. Mm -hmm. And I used to be, I, I would want those things, but I would be like cautious in the risk of life. And I'm not like that anymore. And that was, that was the turning point to that. And do you feel like there's any um other like advice or other like thing that you would want to share with our viewers or just anyone in general after facing like a traumatizing event like that? Um Yeah, like for me talking about it helped. For me, I couldn't sit there and like a lot of people didn't want to talk about it or whatever, but for me talking the more I talked about it the more it helped. Um, and the, I mean, that that video, for example, is not like our general content, but I chose to share it because of that, because I thought maybe there's somebody who needs to hear it, who, you know, is going through a similar, you know, near-death experience or, mm -hmm. or crazy life event that makes them question everything. It really took time. It took, uh, like, the, the change of the mindset, the mental healing of that, the physical healing like i told you guys thank god i had like bumps and bruises they healed but like the mental the the mental change that comes with a near-death experience and the mental healing and just like trauma healing took like a couple of years maybe like not a couple of years in total but like it's a it's a process so yeah it's okay if it happened a year ago and you're still not completely healed from it Okay. But um so how do you feel after this interview? What do you, you I feel? feel good. Yeah, you feel good? Uh so that's our interview with now we're finishing up with Justine. So please like, share, subscribe, drop a comment, let us know what you think. You know, hopefully you got to know her a little bit more, a little bit deeper. Hope you enjoyed our video last week as well. Uh any last words? No. Nope. All right, peace out.